This is Owen. He's about to do a talk. He hasn't even started yet, but you can tell he's nervous. I mean, look at him, sweaty palms, racing heartbeat and a dry mouth. The spotlight is shining directly in his face, but he can still see out into the audience. He spots his grandma. Hello. <laughs> he also spots all the cameras. Now, he has been told uh, it's completely fine just to ignore them and definitely don't look directly down the lens. Owen still has a lot to think about. Firstly, he should remember to breathe, relax the shoulders, raise the head, power pose. <laughs> and finally, he needs to think about what he's going to do with his hands. No. No. Definitely not. <laughs> But the time has come. He needs to get started. All he needs to do is take this little clicker and it will all be okay. <laughs> uh, well, um... Um, oh, oh no, um, oh, uh, oh no. Um. <laughs> no, no, no. That's a different show entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is ridiculous. I obviously have no idea about any of these topics. And surely you guys wouldn't want to see me do a talk on something I know nothing about. What if this moment right here was a moment worth sharing? Because we might think life is better when we're in control, but maybe we're undervaluing the benefit of just going with the flow and just flying by the seat of our pants. For the last two years, we've been running an experiment. And something that most people love watching but are terrified of doing. In a skill you've seen people dominate all day, public speaking. But for our experiment, we wanted to take the idea of public speaking and flip it on its head. We wanted to see what people could do if we asked them to get up on stage and present a big idea, but with one important difference, completely improvised. That meant no preparation, no expert subject, and no idea what's coming up next. Sounds terrifying, right? <laughs> Who in their right mind would nominate to do something like this? And who would want to watch? I realize it's starting to sound more like an experiment in social s and <laughs> <laughs> Which got us excited. Uh, all we needed now was a creative name for this creative idea. But we didn't want to just piggyback off a world-famous brand or anything like that. <laughs> Introducing Todd Talks. <laughs> Think of it as if those boring office presentations had a baby with, like, improv theatre sports, and then that baby was raised by two bearded guys with no idea what they were doing. <laughs> and no idea about copyright law. <laughs> <laughs> that was until, of course, we got contacted by TEDx. <laughs> Hello, Todd Talks. This is Rob from TEDx Path. We need to talk. <laughs> What was that voice? <laughs> Honestly, that, that is how I heard it when I read it, and I just, I've stuck with it. It's, that's what he sounds like. That is not what we practiced. <laughs> but don't worry, we didn't get sued. Uh, ironically, actually, they asked us to speak here today. <laughs> <laughs> it could still be a trap. <laughs> <laughs> because in reality, we are nothing like Ted. There are plenty of fun and legal ways that we are different. <laughs> For instance, TED is super organized. I mean, they get in contact with their speakers months in advance and give them curators and speaking coaches. At Todd Talks, we give them their topic literally seconds before they get on stage. Todd finds expert speakers from all over the world, from Brené Brown to Greta Thunberg to Bono. But at Todd, we will accept anyone, like literally anyone. 
brave enough to get on stage. Uh, from comedians to town planners, scientists to rappers, we even had an exotic dancer step up to the microphone. Ted shares meaningful content, the kind of stuff to make you sound super cultured and sophisticated at parties and on first dates. <laughs> and if people find any excuse to slip a bit of Ted nugget into conversation, like, I was just in the bathroom drying my hands a moment ago, which reminds me of this really fascinating TED talk I was watching. <laughs> OMG, you are so cultured. <laughs> Whereas at Todd Talks, we once had a presentation on how popping pimples might save the world. Ew, yeah, I don't think a second date is a good idea after all. No, it's unfortunately a popular opinion. <laughs> wow, you really squeezed that one out, didn't you? <laughs> For Michael and I, creating things together has been this major passion since we first met especially when it allows us to break things. One of the first things we worked on was a men's night that we created over 10 years ago. Not your typical activity for 20-something-year-olds, we'll admit, but that's exactly why we were doing it. We wanted to break that stereotype of guys that need the excuse of the pub to go and catch up with each other. But this men's night turned into this powerful safe space for self-development, a place where we could go to learn new skills, to talk about what was going on in life, and to create things. It was on one of these nights that we created our first iteration of Todd Talks. Just some mates in the living room, our intention was just to have a bit of fun as we took turns trying our hands at presenting. But immediately we saw our friends turn from these nervous wrecks into these charismatic speakers as they challenged themselves in a way they just had never had a chance to before. And that's what got us thinking, there could be something here. Because amazing things can happen when you step outside of your comfort zone, and learn how to play in those moments. When you don't just take a risk, but you embrace a risk, it can be rewarding, powerful, and even cathartic to immerse yourself in your own fears. So we thought we'd take a leaf out of our own book, embrace that risk, and take this idea public, from our mates to the masses. So swept up in our reckless optimism and enthusiastic naivety, we took this little game and turned it into a fully-fledged show. And the decision to be inspired by Ted was a simple one. We had both been watching Ted Talks for years now, and over that time, we had noticed some key things that Ted does to make a great talk. Firstly, you obviously need to start with this. <laughs> Familiar. <laughs> a subtle cue to suggest that the talk's going to create ripples. Or drown the presenter. <laughs> Then you need a series of well-thought-out picture slides to really frame the idea, give some context to the talk, really take the audience on a journey. Sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes these journeys take you to strange places. <laughs> Next, you need a big, ambitious word to appear out of nowhere. These don't even have to be real words. TED speakers are notorious for making up words in their talk, like this one. Uh, we assume this is referring to magpie season in Perth. <laughs> or this one. This is frequently brought up at my performance reviews. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. <laughs> or there's this one. Of course, you can't forget the obligatory number or ambiguous graph. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, we've brought an example along today. So... <laughs> this is how interesting we are in relation to length of time of our talk. <laughs> as you can tell, we're really hoping for a strong finish. <laughs> Speaking of which, then you need the wrap-up, the in-conclusion slide. <laughs> the take-home message, the call to action. The slow-building monologue, the grand gesture, the battle cry, the cliffhanger. The stand in the centre of the red dot, look down at camera and deliver the big idea. That sometimes having absolutely no idea is worth sharing.
So normally this is where a TED talk would end. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't feel it would be us if we didn't try and break the format a little. So who would like to see a Todd talk right now live on stage? <laughs> All right. You guys are in for a treat because we have with us our two-time reigning Todd Talk uh, champion. World champion, we can say that. Why not? We only do it in Perth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doing a Todd Talk within a TED Talk, and as far as we can tell, the first person to ever improvise on this TEDx stage. Please give a big warm welcome for Stephen B. Platt. All right, now this is where it gets interesting. This is where... <laughs> Stop. All right, this is where you guys actually get to play along. So we've got to give Stephen a topic for his presentation. Now, I have most of a title for a topic here. It has a blank in it. So I need a suggestion from the audience to fill up that blank. Can you please give me a childhood game? <laughs> Let's... Twister, that's, that'll work. Let's go with Twister. <laughs> all right, Stephen, uh, to start, all you need to do is press this little clicker. And <laughs> uh, 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 wait, 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 no, 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 no. That's way too easy. Uh, we're going to hold on to the presentation and control it from our end. This is a much better idea. It'll all be idea. OK, don't worry. <laughs> to give you a presentation on how I turn Twister into a global movement, please give it up for Stephen B. Platt. In 1793, during the Reign of Terror, the French, uh, as seen here by, um, by Paris, um, <laughs> they invented what would become Twister. Now, obviously, Reign of Terror, very bad time, uh, lots of people being executed, um, and there were a lot of just spare heads around. <laughs> yeah, and obviously they weren't edible. Um, <laughs> You know, they, had, they went over to Italy, who just invented ice cream, and they went, hey, and they went, no, that's not going to work. So what they did instead was they thought, let's set out the heads, like 16 heads, and we'll colour them... <laughs> You'll see how it's connected. We'll colour them... <laughs> Red and yellow and green and blue, and then we'll have to try and reach them. This is, in fact the first World Twister champion. Um, <laughs> this... This is a French bulldog who, um, in 1794, beat out the competition um, very, very handily. So, uh, yes. Ah, T.O.D., of course. Uh, very famous in Twister because in the old 17th, 18th century rules that happened in the Reign of Terror, the game used to be called Twister or Die. <laughs> now, we're a bit more civilised these days with how we do Twister. The, the Twister or Die rule was modified by the Victorians in the uh, 1870s. Uh, they decided that, um, yes, we need to get rid of that. And Twister really was spread um, most popularly in the 20th century by the Hells Angels. <laughs> Which, you know, the Hells Angels, they get a bad rap, and rightly so in a lot of respects. But what they were doing... <laughs> oh. Sorry, that is the current head of the Hells Angels who insisted... <laughs> who insisted that when I talked about Twister, I put her in there. So they spread Twister around America. They went along Route 66, and whilst they were doing other nefarious activities, um, they would play a game of Twister at night. And uh, as you can see, uh, this chart here was actually one of the amendments to Twister that the Hells Angels introduced, which was two colours per circle. And... You had to try and, obviously there's a challenge if you had red and it was 38%. It's a little bit trickier to try and get on there. Um, and, you know, most people don't play by Hells Angels rules. We, we really have modified it. So we are spreading it globally. First to Fremantle. Um, <laughs> 
Fremantle has brought us lots of wonderful things. It's brought us the John Butler Trio. It's brought us um, a very nice prison that's now a museum. It, <laughs> it has almost brought us an AFL premiership. Almost. <laughs> Techno determinist. I can say that word, and I can define it. A techno determinist uh, actually helped. It's actually a word that was devised in the 1970s, 80s, when we were trying to spread Twister through dance, specifically techno music. And our main DJ was a techno determinist. He had the multicolored floor, like the disco floor, and you had people trying to dance red, yellow, blue, like that. It didn't work, but he was determined. This, I'm being presumptuous because uh, this is what we'll be doing to celebrate uh, this time next year when, when Twister has become a global movement. This is what we'll be doing. Uh, pineapples are delicious. Sunglasses help with keeping your eyesight, which helps preserve color. Therefore, you can play Twister longer <laughs> into your life. Uh, allow me to show you what I mean. My friends have brought a prop um, that I know exactly what it is. Going to turn and have a look. Oh, goodness. Yes, so, um, some of you may think that this is a trombone. You would be correct. Uh, this is most assuredly a trombone. Let me just check that it works. <clears throat> yep, just about. Okay. Uh, you may be looking at this and thinking, but how does a trombone fit within Twister, Twister, Twister? It's a very good question. <laughs> And allow me to explain. You see, originally, when someone was out in Twister, there would be some arguments, there'd be some confusion, they wouldn't know. What we found is, like the AFL siren, just having somebody on hand with a trombone to just, when someone's out, just to go... <laughs> they know. The other great thing is that this, this uh, the, the doohickey that stretches, because I know what a trombone is, the doohickey that stretches will just grab them, grab the offending limb out of the circle, as they know, to pull them out like so, like... And they get pulled out. This is a very important tool in the Twister arsenal. <laughs> but the benefits. You're going, what are the benefits? What are, what are we going to do? Uh, obviously, uh, people who play Twister live longer, so they can go to the beach more often. Um, they can also go on more holidays because they're alive longer. Uh, Twister also takes us around the world. It truly is a global sport. It, it really is going to be very beneficial. Uh, allow me to conclude, if you will, with a poem. Uh, this is a poem from Wordsworth. Um, not William, it's his lesser-known brother, Keith. <laughs> Keith wrote a poem in the late 1800s. He was quite a lot younger than William. Uh, <laughs> and the poem that he wrote went as such. I wandered lonely as a cloud, floating high o'er dale and hill, when all at once I saw a crowd and that crowd was playing Twister. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that has been your talk. Thank you very much. Stephen B. Platt, ladies and gentlemen. Owen Merriman. This is Michael. This is Owen. Thank you.